Welcome to this week's message from Cross Life Church. I'm Andrew Portnoy. When was the last time you flinched? You know, when your reflexes make you slam your eyelids shut and duck? When I'm playing tennis and I approach the net, getting closer to my opponent, a few times they've slammed the ball back my direction and I had to close my eyes and duck or I'd get hit. But I can't keep my eyes closed and squat behind the net. Fear works like a reflex. God gave us fear as a gift to get our attention and to instinctively protect us when our mind, body, or emotions aren't quick enough to process danger. It makes us human, but we're not meant to remain in a state of fear. That's a problem. That's no longer fear serving us, but fear mastering us. Pastor Darren explains how with God's promises, we can deal effectively with our worries without remaining in fear. Here's Pastor Darren with Lead Your Fears. Welcome to our broadcast and to today's message as we launch a new series today called Tomorrowland, Facing a Future Without Fear. And we're following the books of First and Second Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul wrote these books to the Christians in Thessalonica. There is a church there. He had a relationship with them. And uh, it's a model church. And we're going to hear that in these words, how this model church became a model church. And you're going to hear the answer here as we talk about fear and facing a future. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes to these Christians, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. God's word is true. So when was the last time you flinched? You know that reflex mechanism that we all have? When a projectile is coming at your face out of nowhere and you close your eyes and you duck your head and you get out of the way, that, that's flinching. I flinch when I'm on my motorcycle. When I'm riding my motorcycle and there's a truck or a car and they kick up a piece of gravel or dirt and at the last second, I catch it coming toward my face and my reflexes kick in and I close my eyes and I duck my head and that's, that's saved my face a few times. Now, what if I would keep closing my eyes and keep ducking my head as I'm riding my motorcycle? That would actually pose more of a threat than the projectile that came at me in the first place. You see, fear is a reflex mechanism. It's a reaction. It's not meant to be a response. I'm not meant to continually ride my motorcycle with my eyes closed and my head duck. That would be very harmful and dangerous. And so we're going to talk today about fear and about its impact on us and how it affects us and actually how we affect fear. And we're going to present it in this way, that, that fear as a reaction is good, but as an ongoing response is bad. The fear is an incredible servant, but a horrible master. It's not meant to be ongoing. It's meant to be just this reaction. So, so how are you responding to the stimuli and the circumstances around you these days? Is fear leading you or are you leading fear? We hear that in 1 Thessalonians 1 today about fear and leading it or it leading us. And admittedly, that's a difficult question to, ask, to answer. Are you 
So sometimes you'll read, are you, are you living by faith or are you living by fear? As if it's an either or, but in the Christian life, sometimes faith and fear, they kind of get all mixed up. I want to take you back to Easter Sunday. It wasn't too long ago that we celebrated that. And to the women who were at the tomb, and when they saw the angel, they were alarmed, they were afraid, and the angel spoke to them. And then here's what it says in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 28, verse 8. It talks about these women. The angel had just said that Jesus rose from the dead, and the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Fear and faith were, were mixed up in there. They certainly weren't without faith, and yet they were experiencing some fear. Was fear leading them? Was faith leading them? Mm -hmm. Little of each. And then how about the disciples in the upper room? Again, that very day, that evening, we're told in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19, that Jesus' disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. One evidence of fear in your life is that it locks you down. It paralyzes you. Just like the fear of the disciples. So the, so the men, disciples, these were different than, than the women. The women were actually moving. They were on, they were on the run. But the Jesus' 12 disciples were locked in the upper room. Fear paralyzed them. So fear can, can look like being paralyzed. Being paralyzed from what? From from being right and true to yourself, to who you really are and who God has made you to be. Fear can keep you from that. Fear can keep you from real life, from the life that God has given you as a gift, from the life that Jesus won for you as he rose from the dead. Fear can keep you from life. It can keep you from true purpose and identity, and it can keep you from life, the real life that Jesus won for you. Here the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians talks to these Christians about, about a fear of sorts. And he says to them that they had been serving idols. The idols that were prevalent in the city of Thessalonica at this time were Greek and Roman and Egyptian gods, demigods, legends, myths. Those are the idols. And uh, how that has to do with fear is this. We love to create idols in our lives. The, these gods that were worshipped in Thessalonica, we have our own gods and our idols today. We love to put them together. We love to create them because we design them. And if we design it and we create it, that means that we can control it. And we love control, except when it backfires on us. And it has, hasn't it? We love control until we can't control something that we want to, like a virus or death, or the future. So how do we respond when we are worshiping this idol of control and it comes out that we can't control anymore and, and fear rises? Fear might even try to control us. Fear might even try to become an idol for us and try to master us. And when it does, we're not free at all. We're not, we're not serving Jesus. We're serving fear. Fear is our master, and it's leading us, and it's a cheap substitute for Jesus. The disciples chose a cheap substitute for Jesus when they chose to trust locks on the door. I do this. I don't know if they had deadbolts at that time. I don't think they did. Probably big bars. Uh, they, they trusted in those, those locks on the door more than they trusted in Jesus. But locks are a cheap substitute. Really? Could they really have kept soldiers out of that room if the soldiers had come? No. Jesus, he, he appeared in that room and the locks didn't keep him out. He does much better for the disciples than locks can ever do. So why aren't they putting more trust and faith in him. The Apostle Paul mentioned this in chapter 1, verse 9. He says that the Thessalonians turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
Jesus is not made of stone. Jesus is not made of wood. He's not pieced together by, he's not a man-made object. Jesus is living. He's alive on his own. He died for our sins and he rose to conquer them. Jesus isn't a lie. He's not a fabrication. He doesn't make empty promises like idols always do. Jesus keeps his word. Jesus is the true and the living God. There is no substitute for him. Who can do a better job handling tomorrow? Jesus or are you trying to control it? Well, of course Jesus can. Then why don't you trust him more? Can you today follow the example of the, of the Thessalonians and can you repent and turn from your need to control the future, from your need to to try to control things from the idols in your life? Can you repent of them and turn to the true and living God and serve him like the Thessalonians did? Paul is calling you to that right here. So, so what does that look like? What does it look like to be more focused on leading your fears than your fears leading you? More focused on, on faith responding to fear than being a, a reactionary and constantly living in reaction of fear. Uh, Paul talks about that uh, later in chapter 2, actually. He writes this to the Thessalonians. With the help of our God, we, Paul's talking about himself and some other apostles there, we dared to tell you, the Thessalonians, his gospel in the face of strong opposition. We are not trying to please people, but God. Paul and the other apostles did not let fear master them. They could have been very afraid of the opposition that stood against them. They were persecuted. We can read about it in the book of Acts. But they didn't let their fears lead them. They led their fears. Kids, have you ever been to an amusement park and you, you walked into the park and maybe you knew about it ahead of time, you, you saw it online, you Googled it, you saw it on a website, your friends were telling you about it. There's this great big new ride at the amusement park. Maybe it's a roller coaster. And you looked at it and went, oh, ye, and you became afraid. You didn't think you could go on that ride. And uh, you were there for the day, your brothers and sisters, or maybe your friends, went on that ride and you stayed behind. You were just too, too scared, too afraid. It was too high, too big, too fast. Oh, And you didn't ride on it. But your friends, your brothers or sisters did. And they came back and they said, this is the best ride ever, you have to try it. And it took you by the hand and they, they led the way and you went with them and you went on the ride and you got off and you just loved it. What happened? Your, your friends or your brothers and sisters helped lead you away from your fears and lead you onto that ride. So instead of fear imprisoning you and paralyzing you and making you so that you couldn't do anything, you led your fears, but you had the help of your friends, your brothers and sisters. You know, we all need friends like that. We all need brothers and sisters, maybe older brothers and sisters. Friends who are, are mentors for us and model for us, model going on a big scary ride, model the Christian faith. And that's where the Apostle Paul goes next when he talks about how, what does this look like to, have, to, to lead my fears in this life instead of them leading me. I need to see that and how it works in another Christian. So Paul says this to the Thessalonian Christians so they could they, they leave their idols and lead their fears. He writes, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. All right, I want to pick that verse apart. That verse tells us four things. And I want you to notice these four things in that verse. All right, here, number one. It talks about becoming imitators. So the, the Thessalonians reached out and they grabbed the hands of mentors and models like, like the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. And, th and then number two, it wasn't just the behavior of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. It wasn't just best practices that the Thessalonians said, wow, we want to do that. It wasn't just behavior or best practices, but it was belief. 
of Paul and the apostles, what they believed in. They believed in Jesus Christ and his teachings. That's mentioned there as the message that the Thessalonians welcomed. That, that message, that belief, it was a message about something or someone. It was a belief in something or someone, and that someone is Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul had an intense and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The other apostles taught Jesus Christ, preached Jesus Christ, even knew personally Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul did too. And so when they were mentoring and they modeling, this is the third point, they weren't sharing themselves as much as they were sharing Jesus Christ. And finally, fourth point in that verse, in verse 6. Fourth point, you see what happened here? Paul and the other apostles had already suffered intense persecution because of how they were preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. And then when the Thessalonians followed the apostle Paul and the other apostles, guess what happened? The Thessalonians encountered severe opposition and persecution. And Paul says this, <laughs> in the midst of that, you welcomed the message about Jesus Christ. You didn't back away from it. You didn't hide from it. You didn't let your fears paralyze you. You welcomed it, that severe suffering, with joy given by the Holy Spirit. So the fear of severe suffering was not leading these Thessalonians. They were leading their fears of severe suffering and leading them with joy. <laughs> And yeah, there's one more thing that happened. I guess I'm sneaking one in here. This is number five. There's one more thing that happened here. As, as the Thessalonians looked at Paul and the apostles as models and mentors for how to lead their fears and how to, how to live without fear dominating your life, how to face a future without fear, how to live in faith. As they looked at Paul and the apostles about this, something happened. Paul and the apostles impacted the Thessalonians but then something happened, and it's written about here, uh, here next in verses 7 and 8. Paul writes this, And so you became a model to all the believers. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. So led by the spiritual leaders, the Thessalonians became leaders themselves of other people, all kinds of people everywhere, Paul is saying. Do you see how that handoff happens? And God uses us as agents when we are willing to find a mentor and be a mentor. When we're willing to find someone who can lead us and then willing to lead others ourselves. It's a beautiful way that God works and it's called agency. So can you find a mentor? Do you have a mentor? Especially a spiritual mentor? And then can you be a mentor especially a spiritual mentor to someone else. Can you not just be invited to events at Cross Life Church, to uh, our Word of God ministry, and be invited to, to read our blog, to, to find our memes, our prayer memes on Facebook? Can you just not be invited to find those, but can you invite others to find them too? And through it all, we find Jesus, who is the cure to all our fears. Jesus, who who leads us through fear as the Lord of tomorrow, as the Lord of today, as the Lord of it all. I got to tell you a story. I needed, I needed a mentor and a model this past week um, at my house. Um, I needed to install a garage door opener at my house. And uh, I, most of you know I'm not a very good handyman. And so, uh, but I know my limitations. And I knew this, this magnanimous feat of mechanical and electrical engineering. I mean, this is a big deal. So I needed to reach out to my friend Larry, and my friend Larry came over, and uh, it, was, it was just great because Larry was there. He had, he had obviously installed 1,729 garage door openers before because he knew exactly what he was doing, and he would, uh, he would hand me the tape measure and say, measure there, and I'd measure there, and he'd hand me the pencil and say, mark there, and I'd mark there, and he'd hand me the drill and say, you need to drill there. He'd hand me the right size a wrench and, and a socket, and uh, through it all, plus a, home tr uh, a trip to Home Depot, uh, through it all, Larry helped me install my garage door opener. 
Thank you, Larry. It worked, it worked out great. All because I had him as a mentor and model there. But Larry had to leave before the wiring was hooked up. But he told me how to do it, and he said it was really easy. And so he left, and I, I put on my, my brave face, and I said, I can do this. I don't think I can electrocute myself. And I hooked up the wires. And it looked like the lights were lighting up in the right place. And I pressed the button on the garage door opener. Nothing. So I did a little research. I read the manual. And it talked about moving the wires to a different place. So I moved the wires to a different place. Then I saw more lights. Then my wife came out the, uh, the door to the house, fr from the house to the garage. And, and she came out to the garage. And uh, you remember this, dear? I said, why don't you hit the button? Maybe you'll have more success than I did. And my wife hit the button, and the garage door started moving. And it was, I was praising, it was wonderful, and it stopped. Oh. And I, I had heard of garage doors binding before, kind of getting stuck. I thought maybe that was it. I did, I did more research. Lo and behold, the owner's manual said that I needed to program the garage door to operate. That it wasn't an automatic thing, that it would recognize where to stop, but down at the, at the, uh, at the concrete driveway, it didn't know where to stop up top. I had to actually press arrow buttons up or down and hold those and, and program this garage door where to start and stop. And when I did, it operated perfectly. So what's your way of operating? You know, we all have one, but if we're going to live by a default human instinct way of operating, like factory, factory mode, fear is going to lead us. Fear is going to control us. We're going to be all reacting every day to the stimuli and circumstances in our lives. We're going to believe lies because fear is going to be in charge of how, how we operate. So we need to reprogram ourselves. We need to press the right buttons. We need to take our hand and we need to hold Jesus' hand who's going to lead us. And when we do, we reprogram our heart, our mind, our body, our soul. We reprogram so that fear doesn't lead us, but we lead fear because Jesus is leading us. So turn from the idol of fear and control turn to the true and living God, Jesus Christ, and grab him by the hand, and as he leads you through your fear, reach out your other hand and lead others through their fear too. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, you have led the way through fear and sin and death by rising from the grave how powerful you are. Your presence is now everywhere, and you promise that we will rise too. Give us such a secure and certain faith that we can look at the future and not be afraid, Lord. We can know that you are there, that you have a plan and purpose for it, and that you handle tomorrow much better than we do. I ask Jesus that this message today from 1 Thessalonians, as it's written, in the inspired scriptures by the Apostle Paul, that this message, it, it impacts the heart of someone listening and watching today who is afraid, who needs hope, who needs confidence, who needs courage. And I pray, Lord, also there's another person watching today who, who you have equipped, you've equipped them to, to lead fear themselves, and now they need to lead others too. May this message in our worship today praise you, Jesus. We reach out to you to lead us through our fears, even as we promise, Lord, we will reach out to others too. In your name we pray. Amen. Don't miss out on any future Cross Life messages, including our Cross Kids children's messages. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today at Cross Life Church Pflugerville. I'm Andrew Portnoy, and for all of us here at Cross Life, stay safe and God bless.